Good morning, everyone. This is Pastor Larry Dentler from Bermudian Church of the Brethren, and we're delighted you're with us on this Sunday, May the 10th, uh, 2020. It's Mother's Day, and we want to say a special welcome to all of you, our mothers and grandmothers, as I always say, by blood and by spirit, because in the church family there are so many uh, who become spiritual mothers and grandmothers to us. And uh, we love you and we honor you on this day too. We hope that even with the limitations of these times, uh, that you can have a blessed day uh, and be celebrated for who you are and all that you do uh, for your families and in the life of the church too. Uh, it sure got cold out and I hope you're staying cozy and warm. It seems kind of odd for us to be back in that time. If you read Wednesday's Word this week, I talked about this uh, little ball of grandson Jackson's uh, that I picked it up and uh, all I could think of was, uh, that looks like that those pictures they have of the coronavirus. And I said, then you realize you're thinking too much about the whole coronavirus thing when a child's toy begins to remind you of it all. But it is hard to think of anything else, isn't it, during these days? And so I pray that you are uh, being blessed and, and able to find some peace and some joy and some rest uh, in the midst of it all. I want to say thank you uh, to all of you who have been so faithful in sending in your offerings and supporting some of the ministries that we have going still. Uh, thank you for being so faithful even in these difficult times. And we all look forward uh, to a day soon when we'll be able to think about being back together. Uh, it might be in some different ways at first, but we're going to work towards that and uh, certainly covet your prayers for our Nehemiah committee. Uh, you remember we talked about that last week. Nehemiah, the uh, Israeli prophet who came from Persia back to the Holy Land at the time of the exile to begin the rebuilding of the walls and the temple of Jerusalem and his rallying cry as he gathered the people together was, let's start the rebuilding. So your Nehemiah committee will be looking at what we need to do and how we can do as we begin to get back that way. I had my plans, as I always do for preaching, uh, well ahead. But in light of all we've been going through, it felt like a little detour was necessary. Uh, it seems like I was hearing so many things. Uh, people saying this, people saying that, this preacher said this, that spokesman said that. And uh, so much of what I was hearing didn't really line up with what the Bible teaches. And I know that there are so many questions uh, that this, all of this raises for us. And so uh, our new series we start today, and it's going to take us some weeks to work our way through, Preparing for Christ's Return, Biblical Answers to Questions the Pandemic Raises. And we're going to really dig in and look at what the scripture says about uh, things like the end times and, and the return of Christ and the book of Revelation. And I hope it will be a blessing to you and help you as we walk through this time. But on this Mother's Day, and uh, mothers, grandmas, I see your jammies. You look very nice in your jammies. Uh, let's sing a song that uh, celebrates what it means to share God's goodness uh, as families as we celebrate all of God's goodness uh, for the beauty of the earth. Let's sing together. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the wonder of each hour, of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light. Lord of all, to thee we raise this 
this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for the church that evermore lifteth holy hands above offering up on every shore her pure sacrifice of love lord of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all, Lord, you will be. We bow down, and we worship you, Lord. We bow down, and we worship you, Lord. We bow down, and we worship you, Lord. Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are King of creation and King of my life, King of the land and the sea. You were king of the heavens before there was time, and king of all kings you will be. We bow down, and we crown you the king. We bow down, and we crown you the king. We bow down, and we crown you the king. King of all kings you will be. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. There's really something about that name, Jesus. Amen. So come to prayer time. Have a few updates to share with you. Our sister, uh, Lakota, Mohika is a patient at Gettysburg Hospital. Uh, they're testing for pneumonia, blood clot, and for the COVID-19 virus as she's developed a difficulty breathing. We want to hold her and Victor in special prayer. Our brother Ron Billet suffered a very serious arm injury this week in a fall, a nasty looking uh, injury, and we pray for good healing. Mike and Sandy Neff shared an update for us on Luther Reinhardt. It's been on our prayer list. He's now been found to have two new indications of further cancer. We'll begin a new round of chemotherapy tomorrow. And um, this has been just devastating news for the family as things seem to be improving, and we hold them all in prayer. Pastor Georgia and Charlie Markey have asked our prayers for our friend Cecil Harmon, who's hospitalized. Of course, we continue to remember our brother Harold Brenneman, uh, recovering from recent brain surgery. Uh, we continue to pray for Linda Meck, who's continuing 
to have some real difficulty as she's been treated for some uh, nerve pain and really struggled with some of the medications. Ken Warren, uh, he had x-rays on Monday and was supposed to have a doctor's appointment on uh, Tuesday to see about this uh, medication pump to put in the back to help with the back pain. I had the x-rays on Monday and then the appointment on Tuesday was canceled again and now rescheduled for June 24. So let's keep Ken and Liz in prayer. It's been so frustrating. Joanne Miller's son, Michael, has been our prayer list uh, from Georgia. Uh, is able to be home now and, and recovering, and we're, we're very thankful. Let's pray together. Lord, it's good to be together on this Lord's Day. It's cold outside. We're beginning to get used to spring, and now it's cold again. But you are Lord, and you are Lord of all creation, as we've just sung. And we give you all the honor and glory and praise. Uh, Lord, we ask, Lord, we have some on our prayer list that we're very concerned about. Uh, we pray for Lakota. Lord, please be with her. We pray that she does not have this virus and that what they do find, they'll be able to treat and she'll be better soon and, uh, and be with she and, and Victor. And we pray for Ron. Lord, this injury looked very, very difficult, painful, and we just pray for good, good healing and for the road ahead. We join Mike and Sandy in lifting up the Reinhardt family, and especially Luther. They've been through a lot, and we just pray for you to surround them, bring healing, bring comfort. And we join Pastor George and Charlie in praying for their friend Cecil for good healing there too. For our brother Harold, continued healing, please. Uh, for Sister Linda, we pray for improvement. Uh, for our brother Ken, Lord, it's so frustrating, and we just ask you to see he and Liz through that uh, we might be able to get to a place where if this pain pump is the answer, it can bring some real relief for him. And uh, we pray with thanksgiving that Joanne's son can, can be home, Lord, and on the men. Lord, so many on our prayer list who deal with ongoing health issues in this time, it's hard when you feel isolated and alone, even from your doctors sometimes. So please be with each and every one on our prayer list. Uh, we continue to pray for our nation, our president and vice president, our leaders at all levels as they make decisions. Lord, sometimes we disagree with those decisions. Sometimes we get frustrated with those uh, but to see us through this time. We, we pray for your mighty hand uh, to intervene in the area of this virus. Uh, and we pray for those places, Lord, where they've been out of work, needed to shut their doors, and for workers who have been laid off because of this. And uh, we pray for our frontline workers in the hospitals and the grocery stores, on the sanitation trucks, uh, our first responders, Lord, be with those who are in the front lines who put themselves in danger every day just to keep us going. And we ask you to be very, very, very near. Lord, I pray for everyone who's listening today and worshiping with us. And on this Mother's Day, we want to celebrate mothers and grandmothers by spirit and by blood. Uh, Lord, so thankful for those who have impacted our lives as mothers and grandmothers and as spiritual mothers and grandmothers in the church family. Oh, how they've blessed us. Oh, how they've taught us. Oh, how they've loved us. Oh, how they've cared for us. And we ask that today that we might be able to uh, share just a bit uh, of love and care in a way that they know how much they're appreciated. Lord, we'd love to be together today as we often are on Mother's Day, to be able to share a little gift and to share hugs and kisses on this Mother's Day, we can't be. But, Lord, even across the miles, may our love and handshakes be felt by our sisters uh, as they worship with us today. Lord, you are good, faithful, and true. And as we begin a new study to kind of look into what your word says about the last days, the end times. 
pl please open our minds uh, to hear and to learn. We're thankful for every blessing from your hand and ask for you to be very near in the precious and holy and matchless and mighty name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. There's a wonderful country gospel song that I think expresses what we're feeling in these, these days so, so well. I'd like to, to sing it for you. Life is so easy When you're up on that mountain And you've got peace of mind Like you've never known But then things change And you're down in the valley but don't lose faith Because you're never alone And God on the mountain He's still God in the valley When things go wrong He's right by your side the God of your good times He's still God in the bad times The God of our day He's still God in the night We talk of faith When we're up on that mountain Talk comes so easy When life's at its best Now it's down in the valley the Trials and temptations That's when our faith It's really put to the test Yes, the God on the mountain He's still God in the valley When things go wrong He's right by your side The God of your good times He's still God in the bad times the God of the day, he's still God in the night. Yes, the God of the daytime, he's still God in the night. Amen. Amen. Preparing for Christ's return. Biblical answers to questions the pandemic raises. Houston, we've got a problem. Was astronaut Jack Swigert of the Apollo 13 moon landing crew who uttered those famous words on April 13, 1970. An oxygen tank had exploded, leaving the very real possibility of stranding those three astronauts in space. But in a masterpiece of engineering and science 
and innovation and human cooperation and some of us believe divine intervention, the three made it safely back to Earth. They orbited the moon but did not uh, get to set foot on the moon as the third crew that was scheduled to do that. Perhaps you lived through those frightening days as I did, or perhaps you've seen the well-done Apollo 13 movie. But those words, Houston, we've had a problem, have become part of our language. They've made it into our vocabulary. And over recent weeks, as I've listened and read, it's been clear to me, in the midst of this pandemic, Christianity has a problem. I've seen and heard too many statements and too many reflections that show a terrible grasp of what the Bible really says about the end times and about Christ's return. Some are absolutely sure that we are living out the book of Revelation heard that over and over. Some are scared to death that we're in the last days. And this speaker says that. And that post says this. And too many Christians are trembling in fear. Is this the end? So as I said earlier, stepping aside from the preaching plans I had for this spring, we're going to look at what the Bible really says about all of this and how to apply it to what we're living through. My goal is to calm you and to reassure you. Don't be afraid. And my goal is for you to be well-informed and to be able to be discerning when you hear this comment or read that post. There's a lot of ground here to cover. We're going to look at what the Bible says about Christ's return, what it says about the last days, how this fits with the book of Revelation, Jesus' teaching about this subject, Jesus' parables that relate to this subject, and the signs that Jesus told us to look for, and how we should be responding to what's going on around us right now. I hope you're ready for the ride. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this morning together, and thank you for your word for when we face uncertain and unusual and difficult and different times, your word speaks to us if we'll only go there. And Lord, we want to do that. Today we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and be our teacher and bring your perfect truth and open our hearts and minds to receive from you and from you alone and allow this poor messenger to be in the background as your perfect truth is front and center. Oh, thank you, Lord. Bless and be with us. Teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, please. To 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Paul is writing to the young church in the first century at Thessalonica. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped and even sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. 
May the Lord add his blessing to our reading and of our hearing of his most precious, precious word. Amen. If you've been confused and anxious during these days, you're in good company. Christians in the first century, just a few decades after Christ, as the Roman Empire ramped up persecutions of Christianity, some first century believers mistakenly believed that they were in the midst of the period called the Tribulation as it's recorded in the book of Revelation. And the Apostle Paul helped to correct their understanding. Now we've just read this larger person, but listen again <coughs> and look at these words of Paul. And I've put some color coding on here, and we'll talk about that. Paul writes, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled, either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us, alleging that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let anyone be deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the man doomed to destruction. Paul tells them that yes, Christ is coming again. You see this uh, highlighted in the purple, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then later he says, talks about the day of the Lord. That's an expression used in Old Testament uh, to talk about the Lord's return. Yes, Christ is coming. Uh, he told them, and I have this highlighted in orange, not to get all upset or, or confused or deceived by false information so prevalent. And that was true for them, and that's true for us. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be upset. And please know God's word so you're not deceived. He told them that the tribulation as prophesied in the Old Testament, as explained in the book of Revelation, cannot come until we have seen the great apostasy. And that's in bold on your screen. That's a word that describes a great falling away, a great turning of Christians from true, true faith. Brothers and sisters, I believe with all my heart that we are living in the midst of this great apostasy. In many of our great denominations, unfortunately including some in the Church of the Brethren, the absolute infallibility of God's word, the saving, atoning blood of Jesus Christ, the uniqueness of Christ as the way to life and salvation. All these are being denied. That's apostasy. That's prophesied. And that's, we've been told, is going to be a sign of, of the last times. We're living it. But then he tells them that the man of lawlessness have that in blue here, that's the Antichrist, must be revealed before the tribulation unfolds. A great world leader, uh, described in both Old and New Testament, a great world leader that will unite all the nations under one world government will come on the scene. And we've not seen that yet. But there certainly are some fascinating things going on. So keep watch. So you see Paul clears the air. No, this is not the tribulation. Yes, Christ is returning. 
and this was helpful for them in 60 AD, and it's helpful for us in 2020 AD as well. So correct thinking, first century believers, developed the doctrine of imminency. That means that the return of Christ is imminent, soon. And they lived with a joyful expectation of Christ's soon return. Christ is coming, yes, and that's a good thing. And we see a glimpse of that as Paul ends his first Corinthian letter with a common greeting among Christians of the day. Maranatha. That's an Aramaic expression meaning, come Lord Jesus. So as they would part their gatherings, instead of saying, see you later, have a good week, blessings now, they would greet each other and say goodbye to each other with the phrase, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. In 1918, conservative scholar Arthur Pink, in his great work titled The Redeemer's Return, expresses the, this doctrine of imminency so well. He writes, the fact of the second advent, and that's how he refers to uh, Christ's return, the fact of the second advent is certain because it is expressly revealed in the Holy Writ, in other words, the Bible. The date of the second advent is uncertain because it has not been made known by God. Here, then, we have a truth that is simple to grasp, yet one that is of fundamental importance and great value. The majority of errors and heresies that have gathered around this subject are directly traceable to the ignoring of this elementary consideration. So, let's set the stage for this study, preparing for Christ's return, biblical answers to questions the pandemic raises with an understanding of the promise that is made so clear to us of Christ's return. It is certain he is coming soon. Repeated over and over and over again in Scripture. And it is uncertain. In other words, the time is in God's hands. He hasn't revealed that to us. So let's look at five Scriptures that speak of the promise of Christ's return. And please know that this, these are in no way exhaustive. We could study many, many more. This is a teaching that weaves its way through Old and New Testament. But let's take a look at five. First, from Jesus' own teaching in Matthew 24, a passage that we'll look at a lot more in the weeks of our study. Jesus says, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus, talking about his return clearly tells us that that time will come when the Son of Man will come in the clouds of heaven. On the last night of Jesus' life here on earth, before his crucifixion, he meets with the disciples for what we call the Last Supper. It's recorded in John. And uh, in chapter 14 come these words after the supper. I've, suppose I've, read them and reflected on them at almost every funeral I've ever done in all my years of ministry. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may also be. Aren't those sweet words? Aren't those comforting words that Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if that wasn't true, I'd have been honest with you. And he says to the disciples, 
So thus, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back again so that you may be with me where I am. Or let's go to Acts chapter 1, where after Jesus' resurrection and his days with his apostles, he finally, is this what we call the ascension, is ascended back to heaven. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates. The Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. And a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the, the heavens as he was going. And then suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is a great passage. Even after all that the disciples had seen, they still believed he was going to establish a new kingdom that was going to overthrow Rome. They said, is this now? When's this going to happen? And he tells them what we've talked about this morning, that the timing of his return is not something that we can know that's in the Father's hands. And then the wonderful promise of the Holy Spirit uh, coming upon them, which was fulfilled at Pentecost. And then he is taken back to heaven, the ascension. And the disciples are standing with their mouths hanging open like we would have been if we had been there. And two angels appear and say, why are you looking at the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way. From Peter's words to first century Christians, everything will be destroyed in this way, so what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and devoted to God. You should be looking forward to the day of God, wanting more than anything else for it to come soon. When it comes, the sky will be destroyed with fire and everything in the sky will melt with heat. Peter says, how should we live? We should be living in a way looking forward to Christ's return more than we look forward to anything else. What do you look forward to? Do we look forward to being back in this room together? Oh, yes. I look forward to getting a haircut. I look forward to taking Kathy to a restaurant. What do you look forward to? Peter says we should look forward to Christ's return more than, than anything else. And then some of the very last words of the Bible. Jesus' own words to close the book of Revelation. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Well, that kind of puts the exclamation point on the Bible, doesn't it? Yes, Jesus says. I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So, dear friends, here we have the clear, undeniable promise of Christ's return. Not something to be afraid of, not something to tremble at, a joyous hope, a wonderful expectation. But what does it really mean to us? I think it means several things. The promise of Christ's return is, is a calling to us to obedience. When our hearts believe that Jesus may return at any time, it stirs within us, within us a passion to be ready. And that's the term that Jesus used over and over. 
This is a major theme of several of Jesus' parables that we'll continue to look at as our study continues. If we're expecting Christ's soon return, we should live ready for that return. This impacts our relationships. This impacts our morality. This impacts our speech, our Facebook posts, our ministries. It impacts everything. One of those parables is in Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> the Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom the master puts in charge of his servants, to give them their food allowance at the proper time. It will be good for that servant when the master, who the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day that the servant will not expect him. And at an hour he's not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. In that parable of the wise manager, we are the servant left with the gospel with the love of Christ to share with a broken world and told to care for it until the Lord returns. And are we being faithful in that? Are we being obedient in that as we wait? Second, uh, the promise of Christ's return connects us to other believers. It's like being members of the same team like persons of a family. The belief in Christ's soon return bonds and unites us. Others may not believe in the mission of the team. Together we may face persecution, ridicule, hardship. Think of our brothers and sisters in the church of the brethren in Nigeria. This hope, this promise of Christ's return, is our incredible bond. You see, members of a sports team have a common vision or a goal. They see the championship at the end of their long efforts. They train. They work hard together. Those outside of the team may have trouble understanding why would they sacrifice so much for that goal. But the team members understand. If Christ is soon returning then I join hand in hand with like-minded believers to be ready to serve, to share the word, to share the gospel, even though others may think us foolish. Paul writes to the Thessalonican church, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other. And for everyone else, just as ours does for you, may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Third, the promise of Christ's return comforts us in troubled times. When we know what the future holds, we don't need to be anxious about an unseen future. When we know what the future holds, we can face difficulties, even death, with confidence. Does this pandemic hold some scary thoughts? Sure, it does. Is the world in front of us going to change in some ways we don't like to think about? Perhaps. Might we even die? Maybe. But we're not afraid. For we know he is coming. Again, the Apostle Paul writes to the Thessalonians, 
And now, dear brothers, I want you to know what happens to a Christian when he dies. So that when it happens, you'll not be full of sorrow as those who are who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and then came back to life again, we can also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring with him all the Christians who have died. I can tell you this directly from the Lord, that we who are still living when the Lord returns will not rise to meet him ahead of those who are in their graves. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a mighty shout and with the soul-stirring cry of the archangel and the great trumpet call of God and the believers who are dead will be the first to rise to meet the Lord. Then we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and remain with him forever. So comfort and encourage each other with this news. Author and pastor Max Lucado writes in his book on the second coming of Christ, issues like the millennium and the Antichrist are intended to challenge and stretch us, not to overwhelm us, and certainly not to divide us. For the Christian, the return of Christ is not a riddle to be solved or a code to be broken, but rather a day to be anticipated. So let's begin this biblical journey by affirming our absolute trust in Christ's imminent, soon, return. That is, certain promised repeatedly in Scripture, and uncertain, God has not revealed the exact time. Trusting, believing, and sure of this promise, we are called to obedience, to live ready, faithful to what the Lord, the work he's given us. Trusting, believing, and sure of this promise, we are connected to other believers. We will find like-minded believers. We will join hands for ministry and service and witness because we have the same goal and, and know what's ahead together. And trusting and believing and sure of this promise, we are comforted in troubled times, even like those we're living in. Like the early believers, we cry out with excitement. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. The wonderful hymn, Blessed Assurance, is talking about this promise that we have this blessed assurance of Christ's sure return, his imminent, soon, and sure return. Let's sing this great old hymn together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, 
all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I pray you have a blessed week in the Lord and keep looking up. Keep looking up. Join us again next week as we continue to think about what it means to prepare for Christ's return and, and to deal with some of the biblical answers to the questions that the pandemic raises. Uh, next week, I want to look at that passage that we read in part today uh, that Jesus spoke to the disciples on the last night of his, before his crucifixion when he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust me. Trust God. Uh, I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me to be where I am. Let's take a deep look at that beautiful passage next week. Uh, later on this Sunday morning, I will do my prayer walk here in the sanctuary. I'll be praying especially for mothers and grandmothers and those of you who have been like spiritual mothers and grandmothers. So uh, you might feel my virtual hugs around you, dear sisters, as I think about you and pray for you. Have a blessed day. Happy Mother's Day. And uh, blessings to all for the week ahead. God bless you.